What's this? Now, I mean, I was amazed of all the, oh, everything was so organized within the refugee community. They all say everybody has a task to do one thing and another thing. And this is so much in contradiction of what I've, uh, I have heard from uh, the Egyptian neighborhoods. Well, in the protests that they behaved like that. Mm -hmm. Because they wanted to make sure it was um, that they wanted to make sure that it wasn't violent. Mm -hmm. I mean that there was no violence. Mm -hmm. But I mean, did they? I can't remember. Does he tell about the tying the tree and that? All that? Yeah. went looking for the things he forgot. Who did? He was superior. Oh. So turn it off and tell you. Um, you know, um, we had few information uh, in France and even in the USA because I was in Philadelphia when it happened. And um, the, the way the press put it as well in France, but in America as well is it. Uh, the responsibility of the massacre of 29th of December was um, the responsibility of um, uh, the Egyptian government who shot on the people. And they said there were 23 dead people, hundreds of wounded, and women and children. And they very much underlined the fact that it was the Egyptian army uh, shooting on uh, Sudanese refugee. That how the things was put. Well, it all began quite differently. First of all, it's, it appears that four four young people uh, went to um, a class, of course. Yeah, it off. Okay, the story goes that um, it began. <laughs> Um, and to call it a story is a little bit to diminish its importance. Um, because four young people went to a course at AUC um, that was on refugee law and human rights. And they, so they learned about the rights of the refugees and they also heard the phrase that refugees are voiceless. So they called themselves the voices of refugees. And then, um, they had been thinking about this protest since April. So at the end of September, a few dozen people gathered in the park to, um, to launch the protest. And they put up banners all around the park. <coughs> you can see in this picture, um, this, this picture, yeah. Um, they had banners all, all around with their various complaints and demands that they were placing on, uh, on, on UNHCR, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. And they, they were lots of, there were lots of them in Arabic and they were also in English. And they had pictures of people that had, they alleged had disappeared. They also had, um, uh, for example, they said, um, we want our women and children safe from sexual abuse on the streets. Uh, they talked about no discrimination. Uh, they talked about they, uh, that they object to voluntary, no, to compulsory voluntary repatriation. Um, and they said no to integration. Um, Uh, more and more banners like this. And it was quite decorative because, of course, they had colored sheets hung up to uh, section off the, 
the park and, um, and the famous tree in the middle. And the protest, well, the first thing that happened was that UNHCR immediately went public with the fact that these were people of no concern, that they were economic migrants. In other words, they were all closed files, people who had been rejected from refugee status. <clears throat> so I sent my students out to do research. And uh, they took lots of pictures of uh, refugees with holding up their yellow and blue cards. And in fact, more than two-thirds of the refugees in the protest were uh, people formerly under the protection of UNHCR. <coughs> it was only a small minority that uh, had closed files. Um, people joined the protests by word of mouth, um, by uh, s seeing it, because of course this was the place that they had to go meet UNHCR. Uh, you will remember that a year before, there had been a protest in front of UNHCR's office directly. And these people um, <clears throat> had gathered for a meeting that was supposed to be held at, after lunch. And this had been engineered by an Egyptian NGO. And they were protesting against the June, four, June 2004 um, decision not to interview any more Sudanese, but to give them yellow protection cards as asylum seekers. And uh, they had gone to UNHCR, they started coming at seven, and so there were several hundred of them by noon. And when the, the representative, Anna Lira French, went out to meet them, she couldn't talk with them because they were by this time so agitated. And apparently um, some started throwing stones and the police were called and the representative of the NGO South that had organized it didn't said, said to her on the phone that he wasn't coming to the meeting. So they were tear gassed and uh, 20 refugees were detained and it took a long time to get them out of prison. <coughs> so this protest had learned from the last protest and they had decided that it would be a peaceful sit-in there in front of UNHCR. And it was, uh, its location, the place that refugees then had had to meet UNHCR, was no accident. They decided if they wanted to meet UNHCR, that's where they would all go. It was a strategic point, yeah. calculated. And of course it was right in the middle of the city, and uh, with traffic all around. <coughs> um, <coughs> can you cut that? What? My coughing. Oh. Anyway, um, the, police, <laughs> the police protected them, and they, and they created quite good relationships with the police. Um, At first? All through the three months. I mean, they were chatting with them. When they gave, um, <coughs> uh, refugees would give speeches t probably twice a day with the megaphone to all the park. Mm -hmm. and the police could hear the speeches, uh, talking about their complaints. Um, Sadiq Al Mahdi came, yeah. came twice, twice to the park. On the first occasion he said, Viva the protest, fighting for your rights, that's a good thing. <coughs> and the second time he told them to leave the park. Why? Because he knew something bad is going to happen. Well, I mean, he had been he had been educated. Can you turn it off? And I'm just going to have to get a drink of water. For this, there's no switch on. The one that you tried to give me in the beginning it was just small. The same like this. No. This one.
Mm. There's some uh, raisins in them. Yeah. Now it's now it's supposed to cool. It's ready to it just sits now and cools. Okay. 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 Yes, ma'am. Do you have the extension cord? Yeah. For her thing, she needs to plug it in. I need to plug my camera. <coughs> so, of course, the refugees wanted to negotiate with UNHCR, but UNHCR would have nothing to do with them at the beginning. But you were talking about Sadek and Mahdi oh. co coming the second time. Yeah. Well, when he came, came the second time, of course, by that time he realized that uh, this protest a was illegal as far as the Egyptian government was concerned because they hadn't had permission to have it. Mm -hmm. um, and secondly, he knew that UNHCR wasn't going to move and told them to go home, back to their houses. Um, Do you think it was wise? Well, I think his first, his first announcement, his first speech wasn't wise. I mean, the leaders came to see me here in the house. Before often. the protest? No, not before the protest. After it began, they came and yeah. announced it. Told them not to do it. Don't do it. You won't get anywhere by doing it. <coughs> um, and who, how many of them are those leaders? I mean, it's a, how, how many, many people? Ten people? Well, well, there was only four in the initial group but they rallied all these people. And as I say, they gave pep talks every day. They were very well organized within the park. Um, they had security people with red um, aprons uh, that looked at your ID if they didn't know you uh, before you came into the park. Uh, they had people who were spokesmen for the protest. So it was very difficult to get to talk with just any refugee in the park. Uh, in fact, it was only because my students stayed there for long periods of time that they got to actually talk with the women's, women and the children and with different groups of people. <coughs> um, so they wanted to present a united front and they, wanted, they, and they kept emphasizing that we're the map of Sudan. We're not the south of Sudan, we're not the north, we're, not, we're everywhere. We're Darfurians, we're from the east. Uh, and from the south. Of course, UNHCR also made out as though it was mainly southerners and um, people who didn't want to repatriate, uh, people who wanted to be resettled. And the, one of the interesting things is that these four young people who went to the course learned that resettlement was not a right. So resettlement was not featured except if you can't solve our problems, take us to another country. And they didn't care which country, but take us to another country where there is no discrimination. So we often ask the refugees where they thought that that kind of country existed, um, since discrimination is everywhere. <coughs> um, oh, we we often I mean we went to the park and and at w on one Saturday I remember that Fateh and um, Fateh is on the director of the course migration and Refugee Studies Program, and uh, Ray Giardini, a lecture, and I went on a Saturday. And there must have been 4,000 people there. It was hugely swollen. So what it looked like to us is that people, some people left their flats, maybe because their rent, they couldn't pay their rent, and they were going to be kicked out anyway. Some people kept their flats and came to the park. Other people um, who had jobs went to work and came to the park at night to sleep because there were always more people there at night. Uh, but the whole effort was to keep the numbers up. And as I was telling you, unfortunately, they used uh, unscrupulous methods to get people to come to the park too. Uh, the refugees would get on the telephone, we were told by one Dinka leader who had managed to keep his people from going to the park. <clears throat> they would call them and tell them that the airplane is coming tomorrow. And even on the last day, the day that the police drove them out, 
somebody came with his television and all his luggage. And the park was filled with luggage. People had everything with them. A plane was coming to take them where? In a certain country where there were no discrimination? That's, yeah, that was the like, a, like a building myth to maintain them in the plane. That's a pretty, that's an awful responsibility to maintain people on a lie like that. And we had a seminar in the middle of the protest at, at AUC, and we let the leaders come and talk about the protest. And of course the room was completely packed out <coughs> with people from the protest and other people. <coughs> and, um, and afterwards, outside, we talked to them and we said, you know, there's going to be blood on your hands. This is not going to end peacefully. Something terrible will happen. And it's you told to them. Oh, yes, over and over and over. But they had themselves in a situation in which there was no easy way to disperse. So they had approximately four negotiations with UNHCR in their offices. And finally, on the 17th of December, these four went to UNHCR and they uh, had negotiated a document. I should have pointed out that the attitude of UNHCR began to change, not only when we proved to them that they were people of their concern, as they put it, uh, but also um, a, a delegation came from Geneva and toned, them, toned down their rhetoric, uh, UNHCR's rhetoric. Um, and they had a wonderful Lebanese woman uh, who went to different NGOs and would meet with the refugees and talk to them. And she had... Uh, she was one of the... from Ginevra. She was here temporarily. Um, and she, um, she talked and she could speak Arabic. <clears throat> and she talked with them about the lies that were being told to them in the protests and what the truth was. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, so on the 17th, they, these four signed a document, and the document said that they would, um, they would give, be, one of the things that the UNHCR promised was to give them financial help to get back their flats so they would have some place to go, um, <clears throat> and, that they, that, and that they would look into the closed files, and that they would interview the yellow card holders in the park, and they had to have a list of who was in the park, uh, which uh, apparently these four, um, four people provided them. And that they would go into UNHCR offices in groups of 20, and after all the business was dealt with with those 20, then 20 more would come. I don't know what was wrong with UNHCR's mathematics because they wanted this all done by the 22nd of December, which would have been an impossible feat to do. Um, <clears throat> but when the leaders went back, and I'm putting quotes around the leaders, went back to the park, the rest of the vocal leadership would not accept this agreement. And uh, they said, we have no guarantees. And at that point, someone from Geneva came out into the park and talked with the refugees. And they asked them, where are our guarantees? And uh, the UNHCR spokesperson said, well, the, all the media is here, all the press is here. Um, <clears throat> and they will be our guarantee that we'll keep our promises. But of course, the refugees didn't believe them. And they said, well, the 20, can go in at a 20 people can go in at a time, but they'll come back to the park and we'll all stay here until everybody has been seen. Well, of course, this is impossible. Mm. And UNHCR sent the final of its three communiques to the government, saying that they want, wanted them to dis the government to disperse. And that's why I feel so badly about the fact that Egypt is getting all the blame for this. When, uh, when actually UNHCR had requested them to do it. And they would know very well that the police in Egypt are not trained 
to peacefully disperse any kind of a protest. There's only one system that they know, and that's beating, uh, beating people um, to break up protests. Like in um, other countries. Yeah, and they've never been trained to do anything else. Um, the night, the day that they, the day that this happened, in the afternoon I got a call from uh, uh, Nkuma, what's his first name? Yeah. Gamal Nkuma, the journalist from Al, from Al Haram. Yeah. And he said, I heard they're going to break it up tonight. So I immediately sent two people over to the park. And they, the protesters and the police told them that no, there was, that they were just gathering police to um, protect them from a Muslim Brotherhood protest that was going to happen at the, at the mosque. So refugees were really tricked into staying there. Um, they closed off the roads, they moved in uh, all kinds of uh, vehicles, and they gradually moved in the police force. And uh, they brought all these buses. And then the police started negotiating with the refugees. And they asked them to bring out your women and your children. And of course, nobody knew where they were going. And of course, they were panicked at the idea of being re uh, refooled to, to Sudan. And they thought that that's what would be happening. Mm -hmm. And the police said, no, we're going to take you to camps which turned out to be military camps um, at, at another place. But I mean, they, <clears throat> they weren't, they were, and then the refugees asked, please let them send some people to see where they would be going and, and come back and report. And the police refused. And they went on this way all night until four in the morning, trying to get the refugees to come out. And then, of course, they began spraying water and shooting uh, from water cannons. And they, and of course, the refugees covered the children and women and children with plastic. And this is where a lot of deaths happened because, of course, they were trampled and suffocated. But people also were hit so that they dropped children. Uh, one, the man who hung himself in prison, um, the 29th, um, was said to have been one of those who a baby had been knocked out of his hands and that he just couldn't stand it and hung himself. Um, the aftermath of this protest is, is, has been just terrible mm. because people went back to their well, I mean, first of all, they went to prisons all over the city. Uh, secondly, the Egyptians released almost immediately people who had blue cards and yellow cards. But of course, if you looked at the rubbish the next day, there were blue cards and yellow cards laying all over the park. People lost their cards and all their luggage and people lost money in their luggage and cell phones and all kinds of valuables and clothes. I mean, they'd taken everything there. Um, some people, uh, some trucks of luggage were taken to prisons and people were told to find their luggage. But of course in the kind of mess thing was not possible. And there are said to be luggage stored in some warehouse where nobody's allowed to get at it to, 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 to recover anything. <clears throat> so people were released and they were sometimes, they were driven closer to Cairo. Uh, but just let off <clears throat> anywhere, and people had to walk long distances, and they, many people were wounded so badly they had a very difficult time. Uh, we heard reports of one man was, who hung himself in Hellman Park, but I mean, it's never been confirmed. <coughs> um, many of those who didn't have any homes to go to went to Sakakini Church, and that's what Dr. Miro will tell you about. Um, and because she set up uh, first aid there. Um, Amira, uh, beginning early that morning, uh, the, the, that all of this happened, started ferrying people to the hospitals. And of course, Caritas had closed because UNHCR was closed. 
<coughs> so uh, one of our lawyers got permission from Caritas to, to, and, and told what hospitals he could take them to, it, that they would cover the bills. <coughs> so people were taken from everywhere, and, he, and we would get telephone calls that someone was in very bad condition, try to go there. Um, I mean, they stayed up night and day for two or three days take, taking people to the hospitals. And of course, we don't know how many people we missed. And many, many were so um, so distrustful of the Egyptian hospitals that they didn't want to go. I mean, yeah, there was George, some organs and George and Mohammed had to persuade them and persuade them mm -hmm. to go. And of course, it, the dead bodies slowly, been, slowly started arriving at the morgue. Um, and you read the story about the man who found himself in the morgue alive. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and of course, people tried to go to the morgue, and Ashraf Azar, who works for UNHCR, and uh, Ashraf who? Azar, who works for UNHCR. Azar. I don't He's know. He's just her. a fantastic Egyptian doctor. And he was at the morgue and trying to help the bereaved come to terms with it, take them to go in with them to identify the dead. <coughs> um, I mean, it was a, a really, very really horrible time. And so you should shut it off a minute until I think of something new. And I want to, 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 if you please, to go back to the responsibility in the game of UNHCR. Wait. I don't really understand what kind of games they played. Did, did they really? Is it only errors like you, like so you entitled the report? Are they only errors and misjudgment or political calculation? What do they? You know, what is the objective? UNHCR had never been faced with a protest like this anywhere. Uh, there are many, many protests, and more and more all the time. Um, in fact, there's just one on Iran happening in Burundi. Uh, more and more protests, but usually they're broken up by police almost instantly. So they were never faced with a protest like this that lasted three months. And thousands of people. Uh, well, Africans, yes, of course. Um, they, as I said, they first dismissed them of being of no concern, and then when they had when they had to start, when they finally found themselves having to start to negotiate with them. I mean, for example, they said, "We will, if you'll give us a list of the missing people, we'll search for them." And they said, "Well, probably most of them have been resettled, and we don't know it." Um, but they never, they never really came to grips with the, with the issues. And of course, the things that refugees were asking were impossible, again, with quotes around it, for them to fulfill. How could UNHCR resettle three or 4,000 people out of the population of refugees in Egypt um, with any kind of equity to the others? And resettlement, of course, is this really evil influence upon refugee populations everywhere. Because once you start opening up this door to resettlement, every refugee wants to leave this country yeah. or leave any yeah. country that Everyone. they're in. And I mean, they go to camps like Kakuma and Dadaab or into, in Uganda. And, and the word gets round that they'll resettle people who have protection problems or women who have been raped. And of course, then they disbelieve anybody who comes and gives a testimony that they have been raped, which of course they probably have. So it becomes a, a terrible uh, manipulation of each other. Disbelief of refugees by UNHCR, refugees themselves manipulating the categories that they think will make them successful in being resettled. So what is... Um, it's, a, it's a complete stalemate and lack of understanding on the part of the refugees and on the part of UNHCR. And what about the, 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 the solution of resettlement? If, if UNHCR cannot resettle people, um, I mean... Well, to give you an example, we have a case of somebody who's written a book 
This will not be shown here, right? This film will never be shown here. Sorry? This film will never be shown here. Which film? What we're making now. You don't want to? You have to promise me it won't be shown here. Oh, no, no, not here, but in France. We have a refugee. I, if I film, it's to show to people. Okay. Yes, but not here. Not in Egypt. Uh, we have a refugee who um, wrote a book about Israel's right to Israel. Mm -hmm. And he spent two years and got the death sentence in Sudan, and he managed to escape. And he came here. Uh, and to make a long story short, he was writing his testimony in an internet cafe. And due to some fracar, he had to flee the cafe, uh, the internet cafe, with his passport and his testimony left behind, and his refugee card, I mean his yellow card. Um, he called his wife, who has been a really solid support to him, to tell her to get out of the flat because the Egyptian businessman would know his her, the address and uh, he wouldn't come home that night. But before she could leave, the Egyptian owner of the internet cafe went to the house and said, you know, I have all this evidence. I'm going to turn your husband into the security unless you come to clean my house. I'm going to clean my internet cafe. So for a year and a half, she's been going there as slave labor. <coughs> and worse. Hmm. We can imagine. And I can't tell the rest of the details. But anyway, it finally became too much. And, um, and she um, came to, to Amira for legal aid. And our programs director has talked with UNHCR about this case. And the protection officer said, but if we resettle him, everybody will become pro-Israel. So I don't know what you do with a situation like that. And because refugees aren't talked to like people at UNHCR, they're not dealt with like no. that. No, never. I mean, instead of operating as it does, UNHCR should open, be transparent about its budget, about its limitations, about what it can and can't do. After all, it's governments that make the decision as to who they will resettle. UNHCR can only recommend. Now, the problem is, unless UNHCR recommends, governments don't even consider a file. But after UNHCR recommends, America, Australia, Canada, um, United States, they decide who they will take yeah, exactly. and they reject. Yeah. But they, all, they know that most of the time they're refugees. Well, they know that the countries are the one who has the power to resettle or not. But because UNHCR has the power to refer, they put all the blame on UNHCR. And we have one refugee who had his appointment on the 2nd or 3rd of June for his refugee status determination interview. And when he went for his appointment, they said, sorry, we've now made a decision on the 1st of June not to interview any more Sudanese. So he went a bit crazy. And he said, I'm going to sit here until I'm interviewed. I'm going to go on hunger strike. And of course, he was hauled off to prison. The police were called, he was hauled off to prison. He spent a week in prison. And this kid is just, you know, the injustice of it, because of what the police did, did was beat him up and referred to his mother's genitals, which was such an abuse of his mother. But he can't forgive this, he can't forget it. It's just like an obsession. He wants to sue UNHCR and sue the police. He wants a lawyer, so he sits in our office with a sign saying, I need a lawyer, and I have to go get him out and try to talk with him. And we worked with him for weeks and weeks and weeks. Finally, we took his whole testimony. And because UNHCR promised to look to interview all the yellow cards in the protest, which he was there, 
We gave him his testimony and sent him off to UNHCR with a letter saying, you promised to interview we who were in the park. I don't know what's happened. I haven't heard from him since. But I mean, um, why UNHCR, sh um, UNHCR should have some kind of attaché of spokesman or someone who for communication just to explain what is resettlement and the Im impossibility of uh, resettling people or not. They d never do that in any well, part of the we world? Tr we tried to have some meetings within Amira's office, but they became so rowdy that the UNHCR disappeared. And then, um, because everybody wants to talk about their own case, and why they have a right to be, why, why they need to be resettled. Because, of course, life is so impossibly difficult here. Yeah. And donors don't give funding to the government of Egypt to support these refugees. Well, I think this is also the main point. And, and I mean... The West should be more generous. Well, of course. I mean, Europe is restricting refugees from coming. They ought to put the funds in. I mean, instead of giving money through UNHCR to its implementing partners for the recognized refugees, the tiny minority, they ought to be giving it to the Egyptian government for schools. Tide money that say expand your schools to accept refugees, expand your hospitals. And they ought to be putting more and more pressure on the Egyptian government to give refugees the legal right to work. They are not stamping their pass their refugee cards anymore with cannot work. They've made that much progress. <coughs> uh, and of course when Egypt signed the agreement, when it published it, it left it had no reservations. So, theoretically, refugees, by law, can go to work. Yeah. But, of course, there isn't work. I read work. that on the report. But there isn't work. A slave, yeah, there is some kind of slavery, but not work. Well, I mean, Egyptians are subject to the same informal yeah. economy. Yeah. But Egyptians have families. Egyptians don't have to compete on the high-rent private market. I cut and we'll continue. Yeah. <laughs> this is a great way to welcome guests to dinner. This is a doctor, a pediatrician from mm -hmm. America. And she's here because her husband is, is a Fulbright. And um, you'll have to tell us all about what you're doing. But anyway, uh, she, she went to Zakakini and when the people, as I told you, after the people were released from prison and had no homes to go to, they went to, um, they went to the Sakakini church, mm -hmm. and you, you set up a clinic. Right. Well, actually, the clinic was a makeshift clinic that was already set up, um, uh, I think, within one to two days following the protest. Um, and I believe it was set up because Caritas was closed for the holidays. Well, they were closed because your name yeah. was closed. Oh, okay. Well, in, in any case, um, I volunteered there two days, and actually I volunteered there a good four or five days after the incident happened um, as part of a team sent over by Refuge Egypt, which is another NGO that um, deals with um, health care um, and other aspects of um, service for refugees. Uh, so, um, yeah, I was part of that team. And, <coughs> and how many, uh, what, what were the conditions of the patients? Um, well, at that point, uh, I think the more severe injuries had been triaged and um, referred to hospitals. So I was seeing more um, lacerations, cuts and bruises, uh, body ache, uh, secondary to uh, kicking, um, trauma of that nature, and uh, also a lot of uh, sort of respiratory illnesses, uh, possibly from prolonged exposure to the cold, um, a lot of pneumonias, uh, asthma, uh, and uh, especially with the kids, like runny noses, ear infections, that sort of thing. 
there were um, there was one woman who was um, pregnant who claimed that she had been kicked and was having difficulty urinating and we referred her to a hospital um, there was one woman who um, had been beaten in the face with a stick and she had very uh, a laceration that had been already sutured. So there were a lot of sutured up lacerations that we were just doing kind of wound care, wound uh, dressing changes. But the, were some of the lacerations by knives because... That, my understanding was that according to the people I spoke to, the refugees I spoke, or the, the, the refugees and other people who I was taking care of, the, um, the police had sticks with something sharp at the end. Oh my god. But, um... Just because there was a lot of, a lot of people that said they were cut with knives. Yeah, I mean, and there were, there were, there were sharp, uh, there were sharp, um, uh, it looked like, it's not, it's it, like sharp lines, you know what I'm saying? Like, not, uh, jagged, what you'd expect uh, from, beating. from beating with a stick, just a stick. Um, and were the wounds mainly around the head? Uh, everywhere. But a lot of people told me that they were aiming at heads. And I was also informed that they were aiming at ch uh, people carrying children. And hitting the children. Oh my god. Now, I mean, that's what I was told, but I mean, I wasn't there so but how can you explain this changing of um, attitude? Because at, during the three months, they cooperate with the police. The police were taking care. It was like a care, caring attitude. How come it be, became such so brutal? Well, I think all it's because the different security forces were brought in, hundreds and hundreds and mm -hmm. hundreds of them. I mean, there's said to be 4,000. Nobody knows how many were brought in. They were brought in to riot gear, uh, and as has been, has been described in the report, to frighten the refugees, they would jump up and down and shout. <coughs> uh, I mean, all of this before they finally attacked. What so were they were, saying when they shout? Well, I wasn't there, and I don't hear Arabic, so I can't tell you, but um, abusive things the refugees reported. Insults. Insults. And it's also said that people, people from the flat above, um, threw threw things at them. Yeah. Now the refugees also tried to protect the children and women, so they fought back. And policemen were also injured. So I mean, it was a real riot. Riot. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. Hello. Hello. I think we'll have to stop filming. Yeah. Because yeah, I was there. Well, I mean, I wasn't there there, but I was there when they were discussing that. So I have some inside knowledge on that, but I don't know if I'm allowed to say it. Tell us about it. This is going to France. It will be shown here. But okay, hold on. Let me think. Parties infiltrated. What, what I understand basically is that the um, there were refugees organizing a protest within the walls of Sakakini. And they had distributed flyers stating that there would be a protest on such a such a date, and um, that we would meet in front of Sakakini, which implicated, I uh, mean, Sakakini, which actually put Sakakini at risk in terms of you know here's a, a church yeah. trying to stay neutral in in the midst of this right. rocket, right? Yeah, and um, if uh, if they're implicated, they can be closed down by the government. So I think that was... Well, and, and left-wing parties and one NGO infiltrated. <coughs> they were the ones to stir uh, it yeah. up. Yeah, see, that, and, and that I don't... And I don't they really wanted to march to UNHCR. Right, I yeah. mean, and uh, so they so then Sakakini had to close its doors and throw out all the refugees right. who were sleeping there. Well, they, the thing is, though, that they did try to get some kind of monetary compensation for the refugees in order to get them to leave. Um, so, 
I don't know if it's fair to say that they were thrown out. I know that they were given some amount of money, varying amounts of money, um, but it was difficult to to organize that. So, yeah, it's UNHCR uh, put some money through uh, the Alexander Bank, and people went to the bank and got uh, money according to the first letter of their first name. And so, of course, people went all to the banks and had great trouble getting their money. Some of them didn't get money. There were all kinds of problems about this. But uh, And then, of course, on the, in terms of the burial costs, that's a whole other issue, which we'll do in the next time.